What is a man? A man is a human being who works. By working, he supports himself, his wife, and his wife's children. A woman, on the other hand, is a human being who does not work, or at least only occasionally. Most of her life she supports neither herself nor her children, let alone her husband. Any qualities in a man that a woman finds useful, he calls masculine. All others, of no use to her or to anyone else for that matter, she chooses to call effeminate. A man's appearance has to be masculine if he wants to have success with women, and that means it will have to be geared to his one and only raison d'etre, work. His appearance must conform to each and every task put to him, and he must always be able to fulfill it. Except at night when the majority of men wear striped pajamas with at most two pairs of pockets, men wear a kind of uniform made of durable, stain-resistant material in brown, blue, or gray. These uniforms, or suits, have up to ten pockets in which men carry instruments and tools indispensable for their work. Since a woman does not work, her night or day clothes rarely have pockets. For social events, men are permitted to wear black, a color that shows marks and stains, since on those occasions men are less likely to dirty themselves. Moreover, the bright colors worn by women show to advantage against it. The occasional red or green evening jackets worn by men are acceptable, since, by contrast, all the real men present seem so much more masculine. The rest of a man's appearance is also adapted to his situation. His hairstyle requires only 15 minutes at the barber every two or three weeks. Curls, waves, and tints are not encouraged as they might hinder his work. Men often work in the open air or spend a considerable amount of time in it. Hence, complicated styles would be a nuisance. Furthermore, it is improbable that such styles would make a hit with women since, unlike men, they never judge the opposite sex from an aesthetic point of view. So most men, after one or two attempts at individuality, realize that women are indifferent to their efforts and revert to a standard style, long or short. The same is true of beards. Only oversensitive men, usually one with intellectual pretensions, who want to appear mentally tough by letting their facial hair grow indiscriminately, wear a fun beard for any length of time. It will be tolerated by women, however, for a beard is an important indication of a man's character and therefore of the way in which he might be most easily exploited. His field of work will usually be that of the neurotic intellectual. Generally, a man uses an electric razor for about three minutes every morning to keep his beard in check. For his skin, soap and water are considered good enough. All that is required is cleanliness and an absence of makeup so that everyone can see what he is like. As for his fingernails, they should be as short as possible for work. Apart from a wedding ring, worn to show that he is already being used by a particular woman for a particular purpose, a proper man wears no ornaments. His clumsy, functional watch, worn on the wrist, is hardly decorative. Heavy in design, waterproof, shock-resistant, showing the correct date, it cannot possibly be called an ornament. Usually it was given to him by the woman for whom he works. Shirts, underwear, and socks for real men are so standardized that their only difference is one of size. They can be bought in any shop without difficulty or loss of time. Only in ties is there any degree of freedom, and then a man is usually so unused to choosing that he lets his woman buy them for him. Anyone visiting this earth from another planet would think it each man's goal to look as much like the next as possible. Yet to fulfill woman's purposes, masculinity and male usefulness vary to a considerable degree, necessarily because women who hardly ever work need men for everything. There are men who carefully maneuver a large limousine out of the garage at 8 o'clock every morning. 
Others leave an hour earlier, traveling in a middle-class sedan. Still others leave when it is not yet light, wearing overalls and carrying lunch boxes to catch buses, subways, or trains to factories or building sites. By a trick of fate, it is always the latter, the poorest, who are exploited by the least attractive women. For, unlike women who have an eye for money, men notice only woman's external appearance. Therefore, the more desirable women in their own class are always being snatched out from under their noses by men who happen to earn more. No matter what a particular man does or how he spends his day, he has one thing in common with all other men. He spends it in a degrading manner, and he himself does not gain by it. It is not his own livelihood that matters. He would have to struggle far less for that, since luxuries do not mean anything to him anyway. It is the fact that he does it for others that makes him so tremendously proud. He will undoubtedly have a photograph of his wife and children on his desk and will miss no opportunity to hand it around. No matter what a man's job may be, bookkeeper, doctor, bus driver, or managing director, every moment of his life will be spent as a cog in a huge and pitiless system, a system designed to exploit him to the utmost to his dying day. It may be interesting to add up figures and make them tally, but surely not year in, year out. How exciting it must be to drive a bus through a busy town, but always the same route at the same time, in the same town, day after day, year after year. What a magnificent feeling of power to know that countless workers move at one's command. But how would one feel if one suddenly realized one was their prisoner and not their master? We have long ceased to play the games of childhood. As children, we became bored quickly and changed from one game to another. A man is like a child who is condemned to play the same game for the rest of his life. The reason is obvious. As soon as he is discovered to have a gift for one thing, he is made to specialize. Then, because he can earn more money in that field than another, he is forced to do it forever. If he was good at arithmetic in school, if he had a head for figures, he will be sentenced to a lifetime of figure work as bookkeeper, mathematician, or computer operator, for there lies his maximum work potential. Therefore, he will add up figures, press buttons, and add up more figures, but he will never be able to say, I'm bored. I want to do something else. The woman who is exploiting him will never permit him to look for something else. Driven by this woman, he may engage in a desperate struggle against his competitors to improve his position and perhaps even become a head clerk or managing director of a bank. But isn't the price he is paying for his improved salary rather too high? A man who changes his way of life, or rather his profession, for life and profession are synonymous to him, is considered unreliable. If he does it more than once, he becomes a social outcast and remains alone. The fear of being rejected by society must be considerable. Why else will a doctor, who as a child liked to observe tadpoles in jam jars, spend his life opening up nauseating growths examining and pronouncing on human excretions. Why else does he busy himself night and day with people of such repulsiveness that everyone else is driven away? Does a pianist who as a child liked to tinkle on the piano really enjoy playing the same Chopin nocturne over and over again all his life? Why else does a politician who as a schoolboy discovered the techniques of manipulating people successfully continue as an adult, mouthing words and phrases as a minor government functionary? Does he actually enjoy contorting his face and playing the fool and listening to the idiotic chatter of other politicians? Surely he must once have dreamt of a different kind of life. Even if he became President of the United States, wouldn't the price be too high? 
No, one can hardly assume men do all this for pleasure and without a feeling of a desire for change. They do it because they have been manipulated into doing it. Their whole life is nothing but a series of conditioned reflexes, a series of animal acts. A man who is no longer able to perform these acts, whose earning capacity is lessened, is considered a failure. He stands to lose everything. Wife, family, home, his whole purpose in life. All things, in fact, which give him security. Of course, one might say that a man who lost his capacity for earning money is automatically freed from his burden and should be glad about this happy ending. But freedom is the last thing he wants. He functions, as we shall see, according to the principle of pleasure in non-freedom. To be sentenced to lifelong freedom is a worse fate than lifelong slavery. To put it another way, man is always searching for someone or something to enslave him, for only as a slave does he feel secure, and, as a rule, his choice falls on a woman. Who or what is this creature who is responsible for his lowly existence, and who, moreover, exploits him in such a way that he only feels safe as her slave, and her slave alone?' 